Alright folks, in this video we're going to cover how to add realistic material properties to the surfaces and textures in our model. So if you've been following the whole video series, you may recall this image from earlier on before we started discussing natural and artificial lighting. This was a render of the kitchen scene with all SU Podium material properties removed from the model, and the point of this image was to establish that while Podium gives us a lot of realism for free simply by turning on the sun, uh, we need to spend some time on materials for the image to really shine. So here I faded to a version of the kitchen with material properties added back, and you can see how much better it already looks with the reflections on the floor, the cabinets, the tiles, uh, the stove hood. So this is what we're going to be working toward for the rest of the video. So one more time, we're going from this, which is pretty flat and a little bit doughy looking. It almost looks like a plastic model. And we're going to end up with this, which looks a lot more lifelike. Okay, so let's start with the cabinets, since they're one of the most noticeable surfaces. So to modify the material properties, I open up the SU Podium Material Properties dialog, grab the eyedropper tool, and I'm just going to hover over the cabinets and click. And as you can see, the name updates in the Material Properties window to show that we've successfully selected that material. Okay? Now if you recall from the example image, this was set up as a moderately reflective surface, so all we really need to do is add some reflection to the material. So in the Basic Properties section, we have three different values, Diffuse, Reflection, and Transparency. Diffuse refers to the surface color of an object, whether that's a solid color from SketchUp or an image texture applied to the material. Now all podium materials start at 100% diffuse by default. Reflection of course refers to the reflectivity of the object, and transparency controls how much light is allowed to pass through the material. These three values should always add up to 100%. Anything above or below that is physically inaccurate. Now podium won't let you go above 100, but it does let you go below. But the thing is, when light strikes the surface, energy doesn't just disappear, it's either absorbed, which corresponds to the diffuse value, or it's reflected or transmitted. So Podium will attempt to keep these sliders in sync. You can see if I move the transparency up, the diffuse component goes down, uh, but it doesn't always work. So if I make too many changes, the sliders get out of sync. So just keep an eye on this value and make sure these three values always total 100%. Okay, so back to the cabinets. Actually, all I'm going to do to this material, bring this all the way back to 100, and I'm going to add 15% reflection. That's it. This material is as simple as that. It's just a slightly reflective, glossy cabinet finish. Uh, and so we're adding reflection. I'm going to click Apply, and then we're going to see in the next render that it's now reflecting light. Okay, next we're going to move on to the two floor materials, which are this hardwood over here in the corner and the tile throughout the kitchen. Now, the approach is similar. I'm actually going to use exactly the same reflection value on both of these materials, uh, but there's a key difference. Unlike the cupboards, I don't want the flooring materials to have a polished finish. I want these materials to reflect light, but I don't, I don't want them to appear glossy. So if you look around you, I think you'll see this is probably the most common material type in the real world. Most surfaces do have some degree of reflectivity, but very few actually appear mirror-like. So we only see pristine crystal clear reflections on relatively few materials. Um, certain plastics, chrome on a sink for example, uh, but more often reflection is going to be a lot more subtle than that. So what I'm going to do for these two materials is make sure I have the tile selected, set reflection again to 15%. But this time, I'm going to make sure the blurred reflection checkbox is checked. I'm also going to add 3% under bump depth. Click apply. Close this, reopen. Grab the eyedropper again, and I'm going to do the exact same thing to the wood floor. So 15, blurred reflection, and we'll just go with 3% bump depth again. I'll click apply to make sure those settings are saved, and then I'm just going to go to a different scene so that we can see this a little bit better in the renders. Okay, so what we've done is told Podium we don't want the reflection to look polished and glossy, we want it to have a blurred appearance, and you'll see what that means when I bring the images up on screen. The bump depth attribute is Podium's solution for a bump map, so we don't let you upload an external bump map. Instead, what happens is when you add a value in this field, Podium's going to take the, gray, the texture image, convert it to grayscale in the background, and use that as an automatic bump map. So what's happening when I put a 3 in this box is we're telling Podium this isn't meant to be a perfectly smooth material. It's got a little bit of roughness to it. 3 is a relatively low value because kitchen tiles are still 
fairly smooth materials, but if I was doing something like a brick wall or a rock wall, I would probably use a much higher value under bump depth. Uh, you want to be pretty subtle with this for the most part. Most materials aren't going to have it at all. Um, but stuff like tiles, these kitchen tiles back here probably will also have some bump to them. Rocks, masonry, cobblestone. Um, just be aware that adding too much bump depth can introduce unwanted noise into a render. So use it in moderation, uh, and when in doubt, probably try it without the bump depth. And then if you really think you need the appearance of roughness, add it in you know small amounts when needed. Okay, so let me open up some comparison renders and I'll show you the changes that we just made. Okay, so I've opened a few kitchen renders in Photoshop. This first image was actually created before any material properties were applied to the floor. So this is with 100% diffuse on both floor materials. Uh, they look very matte, as we would expect from a material with no reflection. Now I wanted to show you what it would look like if I turned on the reflection but didn't check the blurred reflection attribute. So this render was created with 15% reflection, but I left that blurred reflection turned off. And as you can see, we get a super polished result, similar to what we saw on the cabinets over here. There are some floor materials that look like this. These might be appropriate settings for a highly polished marble floor, for example, but I just didn't think it looked quite correct for a residential kitchen. So these are the settings with blurred reflection turned on. And as you can see, we're getting a much more natural feeling floor material. Uh, we still see the reflected light coming in through these windows, um, but it feels more true to life. We don't have that high polish. There's a little bit of roughness visible uh, and that reflection is nice and blurred and a little bit more subtle. Okay, let's move on. So I'm sure at least some of you out there are thinking, well, great, this all makes sense so far, but how am I supposed to know that those two materials should have 15% reflection? Well, here's the thing. There's usually going to be some amount of iteration needed when you configure materials, but the longer you spend rendering, the more intuitive this will get for you. So after you've set up a wood floor a few times, you'll start to know what settings are going to look appealing. You know, for, for example, off the top of my head, I know that this glass pane is probably something like 3% diffuse, 87% transparency, just because I've, I've seen those settings so many times. And I know that a wood floor looks pretty good with about 15% blurred reflection. But the thing is, you never actually have to guess at material settings because Podium comes with a huge library of pre-made materials in the Podium browser. So I didn't just pull that 15% value out of thin air, I actually just copied it from one of the materials in browser. So if I'm not crazy about this floor material currently in my scene, all I need to do is open up the Podium browser, which I did by clicking the box icon. Then I navigate to the materials category. Scroll down to wood floors, which I think is almost all the way at the bottom. Maybe it is at the very bottom. Yep, there's wood flooring. And then I can either scroll through right here with the buttons or clicking and dragging or click see all to expand the category. Then if I want to use one of these in my scene, I just find one that I like. Click the download button. So I'll grab this walnut texture, click the download button. Going to minimize Podium Browser and then it's going to come into the scene on a cube. So there's the material cube and that's just a placeholder we use to get the material into the scene. Place it anywhere in my model. And now to use this on my floor, I just need to transfer it from the cube to the floor. So I grab the paint bucket, eyedropper, color pick that material cube. Then I need to open up the floor group and just paint this texture on the floor. So as you can see, We've replaced the previous texture with the new one that we just downloaded into the scene. And the beautiful thing about Podium Browser is that all these materials are pre-configured with SU Podium material properties. So if I open up the material properties dialog again, grab the eyedropper and color pick that, you can see even though this is a different material from the one we had before, it's already got 85% diffuse, 15% reflection, and blurred reflection is already turned on. So this floor is ready to go and you saw how easy it was to just jump into Podium Browser, browse through the library, and pick something new. So this makes it really easy to do look development, try a bunch of different textures and materials on your floor until you find something that you're really happy with.
Okay, and this also leads me to a second point. So not only is Podium Browser full of really good materials to apply to your model, it can also act as a really good reference guide when you're creating materials from scratch. So why don't I show an example of that? Uh, let's say I don't want to use this tile texture from Podium Browser, and I didn't find anything I like in the library, and instead I want to use an imported image file. Obviously, all I need to do is color pick this material, and so I know the settings are diffuse, 85, blurred reflection, 15% reflection. And now all I need to do is clone this into a new material. So what I would do is with this actively selected in the materials palette, I just click the create material button. And I'll name this imported tile texture just for clarity. And then all we need to do is change the texture image. So we're just taking the same settings from before and using them on a new image file. So let me do that. Click the browse for material. I have it saved. And I think the one I wanted to use was tile import 02. So I click open, click OK. And now it's going to create the material and all I need to do is replace it on the floor. So I double click to get into the group. Make sure the face is selected, not just the group. Grab the paint bucket and replace the floor. Obviously, you can see the scale is way off here, so I can just go into edit, and right now this is like 5,500 millimeters. Let's bring this down to like maybe something like that. Obviously, with scale, you just need to play around with it a little bit until you've got the size that you like, but that actually doesn't look bad. And for the sake of this demonstration, I think that gives you an idea of how to create a new material from scratch that was based on an existing Podium Browser material. Because if I color pick this now, we have imported tile texture, but it's already got Podium material properties assigned to it because all we had done was duplicated the material from before. So click apply and we're done with our tile, even though it doesn't necessarily look amazing. Um, it's good enough for the demo. So the point that I'm making is that Podium browser really should take almost all the guesswork out of material creation. Right, So even if you need to create a material from scratch from an imported texture, you can still pop into Podium Browser, look through the material library, and find something similar, download it in, into your scene, take a look at the settings, and then just use those settings with your imported texture. All right, so we've pretty much covered the basics of material creation in Podium, but there are a few other things in that interface that we need to cover. So let me close that open the material properties interface, and we'll start right here at the top with material type. Okay, so material type. If I open this dropdown at the top of the interface, there are two different material options, default and metallic. Now, it's relatively obvious that metallic is meant to be used for metal materials, but what exactly is the difference between these two options? Well, it has to do with the color of reflections. So, when non-metallic objects reflect light, they directly reflect the color of the environment or light sources around them. Metallic surfaces are different in the sense that when they reflect light, the reflections retain the underlying base color of the metal. So I've got this test scene set up, and I'm using Podium Browser Brass 02. That's just here in Podium Browser in the Materials category under Metal V2. I've got it applied to this sphere, and I'm just going to show you two different renders, one with the metallic material type and one with the default material type, and we'll see how the reflection colors differ. So here's that example side by side, and the difference is pretty obvious. On the left, I'm using the default material type, and as you can see, the reflections are much brighter. It's taking on the appearance of the white light coming in through the windows and also the white color of the walls. On the right, I'm using the metallic material type on the sphere, and as you can see, we're retaining all that nice color from the underlying brass texture. So that's material type. Um, it's a pretty easy concept. I just wanted to illustrate it so that you understand exactly what happens when you switch between those two material types. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is blurred transparency or translucency. Now down here in the interface, beneath the refraction settings, we've got this blurred transparency checkbox. And when this is checked, what it does is takes a semi-transparent surface and makes it translucent, which means you're still able to see through the material, uh, but everything behind it will be blurred. So translucent material lets light pass through, but not precise shapes. So 
if we turn this clear glass pane into a translucent one, we'd see sort of a silhouetted outline of this fence, but it would all be blurred. So let me show you what that looks like. I'm gonna make sure this is selected, turn on blurred transparency, um, and then I'm gonna give it like 70% transparency and no reflection, just to demonstrate. Click apply, and then I'll make two renders, one with the translucent glass and one with the clear glass, and I'll show you the difference. Okay, so if I open up the two renders, you can see the difference pretty clearly. This is the first image without blurred transparency turned on. We're getting nice, soft light coming in through the windows. And here's the second image with blurred transparency. As you can see, we're still seeing the silhouette of the fence, the grass, and the deck outside, but everything behind the glass panes is blurred. In addition to that, we're getting a little bit less light coming in because part of the light is being blocked by the translucent glass. So if you see in this first image, we're getting a lot more light up here on the ceiling and down here on the floor. If I turn on the translucent glass, part of that light is being blocked and we're getting a slightly dimmer image. Okay, so that's blurred transparency. It may take a little bit of testing for you to get the settings right, um, the balance between diffuse and transparency in your material settings. Uh, but this should give you a pretty good idea how the setting works and what it looks like when it's turned on. Okay, moving on. So at the very bottom of the materials interface is this cast shadows checkbox. And if you uncheck this box, it means the selected material will no longer cast shadows in your render. So you're almost always gonna wanna leave this checked because most of the time we want the objects in our scene to cast shadows. However, the option is there so that you can eliminate problematic shadows if the need arises. One example that we sometimes use is if you're using a background image in your scene and it's casting an unwanted shadow, um, you can uncheck this to turn off that shadow casting. So in this example, I could color pick this background image, turn off cast shadows, and then if I make a couple of renders, you should see the difference. Okay, so here it is with shadow casting enabled on those trees, and here it is with shadow casting turned off on that specific material. Obviously we're losing the shadows from the trees, but everything else in the scene is still casting shadows. From the fence, from the deck, from the building here, we're still getting shadows, but the shadows from the trees have disappeared. So that's what the cast shadow toggle does. This probably isn't the best example, because I happen to think the shadows from these trees actually looks pretty good. Um, but just know that that option is there if you've got an object in your scene and it's casting a shadow that you don't like, you can always turn that off. Okay, right here beneath the diffuse reflection and transparency settings, we have a section for refraction. Now, this is mostly gonna be applicable to objects that have transparency. The classic example of refraction that I think everyone has seen is when you dip a long pole into a pool of water. Light is refracted at the air-water interface right here. So it appears that the pole is bent at an angle. And lo and behold, that's exactly what we see if I render this scene with Podium. So this water surface uses water from Podium Browser. It's Podium Water 01. And as you can see, in the refraction settings, we've just selected water from the preset dropdown. And that gives us an index of refraction of 1.33. Another time you'd use refraction is with curved glass. So bowls, vases, wine glasses. Uh, if we went into Podium Browser, and downloaded one of these glass items, I think we'll see that it probably has some refraction set on it. So I'm gonna color pick that material, and under refraction we have 1.52. So that changed from 1.33 with the water material to 1.52. And that's because glass and water refract light a little bit differently. This number is called the index of refraction, and every material has a unique value for that. Um, but you shouldn't really need to concern yourself with that too much. Uh, Podium has a drop down here with presets for several common material types, right? So if you're making glass or water, plexiglass, oil, jade, you just pick from the drop down uh, instead of trying to look up these values on Google or something like that. So refraction is one of those things you probably won't use all that often. We covered water and curved glass, uh, but windows, for example, shouldn't really have any refraction. When you look through a window, you don't see noticeable distortion through it. So if I color pick this pane, we're using Podium Browser Thin Glass, and as you can see, refraction is set to none. So that's pretty much all you need to know about refraction. Um, you can certainly experiment with these settings. We definitely encourage that, 
but if you're unsure about whether or not an item you're creating should have refraction on it, I would say just check Podium Browser, look for a similar item, download it into your scene, and see whether or not we've applied refraction to the materials. And then just go from there and customize your own materials as needed. Okay, the final thing we need to cover in the materials interface is the edge smoothing attribute right down here toward the bottom. Now the edge smoothing attribute lets you set the amount of anti-aliasing on a per material basis. This has two purposes. One would be to improve the edge quality of certain materials and eliminate jagged, harsh looking edges or to reduce render time by lowering the amount of edge resampling on certain objects. So let me back up a little bit and explain what that means for people who are new to rendering. So Edge clarity is sort of one of the inherent challenges in rendering. So to deal with this problem, Podium completes an operation at the very end of the render process called anti-aliasing or edge resampling. Uh, this is an application of subtle smoothing to make edges appear cleaner and less jagged. So let me show you a couple renders with varying levels of anti-aliasing to show you what this setting actually does. So in the first image I'm going to bring up, all the materials in the scene have had this edge smoothing attribute set to low. And in the second image, they're all set to default. So if I flip over to the image, this is the render with all the edges set to low. And you can see up here along this long diagonal, we're getting this jaggedness over here on the door, the blinds, um, this trim down here. If I zoom in, it's very clear that these edges are not as crisp and clean as we'd like them to be. So if I show you the default render, that's much better. If I zoom out, you can see that's looking a lot cleaner and more appealing. So here it is again with low anti-aliasing. And here's that image with all the edges set to default. Okay, so if one is clearly better than the other, why would we ever want to use low anti-aliasing settings? Well, the chief reason is time. So this image with all the edges set to low took eight minutes and 50 seconds. And then the default render with all the edges set to the default setting took 10 minutes and 58 seconds. So that's about a 20% increase in render time. In the case of the kitchen, that 20% time increase is a perfectly reasonable trade-off for the additional quality that we get. Uh, but this isn't really the type of situation we had in mind for the low anti-aliasing setting. So. A good example of the type of item where you might use low is on 3D plants and trees. So if I switch over to SketchUp and zoom in on these 3D trees from Podium Browser, you can see there are hundreds of leaves, which means hundreds of edges to resample at the end of the render process. So for people doing landscape architecture, you might end up with dozens of trees, plants, flowers, and ground cover in your images. Um, and so that 20% increase in render time could, could easily end up much, much worse. So what we do when we configure 3D plants is set the edge smoothing attribute to low. So I come in here to the material properties, color pick one of these leaves, edge smoothing low. Another one, edge smoothing low. I think you'll find that that's pretty consistent throughout Podium Browser. For all of our 3D vegetation, leaves, stems, we tend to use the low edge smoothing setting. And that's usually pretty effective in minimizing the render time without sacrificing too much quality. Um, because ultimately, edge clarity on trees is going to be a lot less critical than it is on something like a beautifully designed kitchen cabinet that just needs to look crisp and clear and pristine. Uh, and so that brings me back to the kitchen. This is the sort of situation where we might actually go above the default settings on certain materials, particularly cabinets or anything with fine edge detail. So what I might do is color pick the cabinet, and instead of default edge settings, I could use high or ultra, and that should help these cabinet edges render a little bit more cleanly than they did with the default settings. Okay, so that's the edge smoothing material setting. Now, normally the amount of anti-aliasing is actually controlled by the render preset on a global basis for the full scene. Um, the reason this setting's available on a per material basis is to act as an override to give you the power to increase or decrease the settings for a specific material. And usually that has to do with either fixing up edges that need to be clearer or in the case of the trees, trying to reduce the render time on certain render intensive objects.
Okay, I think that just about covers the material properties dialog. Now, I know that was a lot to take in. This was the longest section of video that we've had so far, I think. Um, so don't hesitate to go back and reference this stuff. I'm going to timestamp the video so that you can find specific sections easily. And as I mentioned, Podium Browser is a great resource for material creation. You can always search through the browser, find things that are similar to what you're trying to create, and see what settings we've used. Okay? In the next section of video, we're going to start talking about render presets and what all the different presets are used for.